Quarty Blue Sea is funded by the European Regional Development Fund under the Interreg 2 Seas programme. Quarty Blue Sea aims to create a more sustainable, circular and soilless horticultural process. By continuing the trials, Haughty Blue Sea aims to achieve two of the main goals of the project, optimising the biochar production to produce an efficient growing medium and improve the CO2 capturing and cleaning process to reuse CO2 in greenhouses. This will ultimately lead to a decrease in the use of chemical crop protection and fertilisers, reduce CO2 emissions and provide new circular economy solutions in the two seas area. Hi everyone and welcome to the second Haughty Blue Sea webinar on the production of chitin from shrimp shells or Chinese mitten crab. Haughty Blue Sea is a multi-partner project supported by Interreg 2 Seas, which is developing a sustainable greenhouse model for commercial horticulture. So today we're going to hear presentations from four of the project researchers, then we'll have a short panel discussion and as I said an opportunity for questions. So let's begin now with a brief introduction to the shrimp and chitin valorization chain from project lead, Dr. Bart van der Castile. Thank you, Christa, for the nice introduction. So today we have the second valorization chain, which is the topic of this webinar. So in this uh, Horty Blue Sea project, we have five residu residual materi materials that we try to upcycle to be used in greenhouses and in growing media. And today we will talk about the shellfish waste. For each of these waste streams, we are looking for the best treatment or processing option. And then we try to uh, optimize the quality of the building block that we have produced. So to have an optimal functioning of this material in the growing medium, uh, for instance, as fertilizer or as medium for a uh, plant rooting. However, for each of these materials, this is a specific way of, of processing that is needed and a specific way of quality control, of course. So based on this expertise, we have defined four valorization chains uh, for each of these materials. So the first valorization chain, it was the topic of the webinar uh, previous week. And today we focus on the shellfish waste uh, that we use as a feedstock to produce chitin. So the chitin can be processed or can be produced in two ways. So we start from the waste and we can do a chitin extraction it can be done by chemical extraction or by enzymatic extraction. Or another way of processing the waste is by uh, heating, by thermal treatment. So we call it torrefaction. And by these two products, we want to increase the disease suppression uh, in growing media, but we can also use it as a fertilizer. So we have two feedstocks that we focus on in this webinar. We have first the brown shrimp and um, more in detail, the peels of the brown shrimp, because brown shrimps, they are very delicious to eat. But the peels, if we can collect them, uh, it's a good feedstock maybe to make chitin out of it. On the other hand, we have another feedstock. It's the invasive species of the Chinese meat and crab, which has to be removed from our uh, uh, waterways and um, because it's, it's invasive. So here we have the whole biomass of the cra uh, crab that is available as a feedstock to maybe produce chitin out of it. For the peels, we have, of course, the problem where the, the peels uh, are, can be collected, but it will be also uh, covered in this webinar. So the baseline scenario of this valorization chain is that shells, shells are at this moment only partly valorized. And we want to go to a new scenario where the, we convert uh, the, the shrimp shells into chitin by thermal treatment, by enzymatic or by chemical treatment. And this chitin can then have an added value in growing media as a fertilizer or as a stimulant of the microbial biomass in the rhizosphere. So we will do uh, experiments at different uh, scale uh, scales. So we have really lab scale experiments um, and to produce a very small amounts of different guidance, which are then tested. And then we can upscale 
we can do it in a reactor for enzymatic production, uh, or we can do it in a reactor for a heating thermal treatment. So the, the torrefaction uh, reactor and, and which we can use bigger amounts of feedstock. So we go from uh, the shell to the chitin and this chitin can have different roles in a growing medium. But we have to take into account, of course, that the shrimp shells, maybe they can be used for other applications or to say it in another way, maybe we can also extract other compounds from the shells beside the chitin. So it's maybe the, the, the story of the chitin from shrimp, shrimp shells, it's maybe only one of the, the different aspects in a, in a certain valorization chain. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Bart. <clears throat> And now um, we're going to show a short film which showcases Willy the Loisy Bavisco shrimp peeling machine, which is really interesting innovation. De Hanaupal machines zijn nu al een goede 12 jaar operationeel. Uh, we zijn daarmee gestart omdat er de noodzaak van was om een bepaalde garnaal te krijgen zonder bewaarmiddel. Op vandaag worden alle garnalen naar Marokko gevoerd om bepaald te worden met de nodige hoge voetafdruk of ecologische voetafdruk. Dus transport naar hinder, de, de dingen die erin komen, de conservanten, de conserveringsmiddelen die erbij komen, transport terug, dan verpakken, dan zijn ze nog drie, drie weken goed in de supermarkt. Ja. Dan ben je al een beetje vragen te staan, hoe zit dat eigenlijk met de, de basis van het product? Ik ben ons product uh, zijn we vooral geïnteresseerd in de, in de schalen? Ja. Uh, wat gebeurt daar nu mee met die schalen? En, uh... Die, die, uh, die palm komen dat niet terug. Is, uh, wat dat ze er geen mee doen, is voor mij ook nog een, een, een vraag. Ja. Maar ik vrees uh, ja, dat dat aan dat afval gaat. Ja. Wat dat jammer is. Maar het voordeel van de palmmachine is uiteraard dat het een op zichzelf een machine is. Vermoeid niet, kan 24 uur of 24 uur draaien. Ja. Uh, een machine pelt ongeveer 15 kilo per uur. En die kan dus 10 uur aan een stuk draaien, sowieso. Maar tussentijds moeten we wel een keer afspoelen. Dat wil dus zeggen dat we continu een bepaald product hebben. En ook zeer snel vanaf aanvoer naar de, terug de distributie. We hebben dus een, product, een bepaald product zonder bewaarmiddel. Maar onze restroom, de pellen, de schalen, de knoppen, zijn ook zonder bewaarmiddel. Als je weet dat er twee. Twee derde afval of restroom is hmm. van, het, van een kilo garnaal of van een hmm. hoeveelheid garnaal, dan, heb je, dan zit je direct dat je met een grote hoeveelheid zit. Als wij ongeveer, op, op vandaag doen wij misschien uh, een paar ton uh, garnaal uh, uh, in een week, hey, laat ons zijn in het seizoen dat dat ongeveer rond de 10 ton komt, maar ook niet meer, hmm. uh, waarvan dat we dan maar uh, een 3 ton bepaald producten en de rest is restroming. Mm. Met aanpassing kan die machine ook gebruikt worden voor andere, bijvoorbeeld voor, ja, voor scampies of andere soort garnaal. Mm. Maar die is wel typisch ontwikkeld voor de grijze garnaal, voor de kranhond kranhond. Who knew that shrimps got sent to Morocco to be peeled and then sent back again? It's incredible, isn't it? Um, so next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Johan Robens from ILVO, the Flanders Institute for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. And Johan's going to tell us about the lab scale extraction of chitin. To start with, we have another short film made in the labs at ILVO. What link could there possibly be between brown shrimp and healthier vegetable plants? Research shows that a compound found in shrimp peels called chitin can have a positive effect on plant growth. Nine scientific and industrial partners are figuring out just exactly how. Every year in the North Sea alone, 20,000 tons of brown shrimp are caught and eaten as a delicacy. And after peeling those shrimp, two-thirds of the peels just end up in the garbage. This trash could become a treasure, though, if processed in a certain way. Chitin is a molecule we do find in the peels of shrimp. Uh, often these peels are just thrown away, and that's a pity because chitin is a very valuable uh, molecule. Uh, you can use it like to make biodegradable plastics, 
but we want to use it as a growth stimulant for uh, lettuce, for tomato and for strawberry. In this InterReg 2Cs project, Flanders Research Institute for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, or ILVO in Belgium, has teamed up with eight scientific partners on both sides of the channel. ILVO has developed a process to extract the chitin from shrimp peels, and they've been doing trials with chitin in lettuce and strawberry cultivation. Previous research at ILVO showed that if you add chitin to the growing medium, you stimulate the beneficial bacteria and fungi around the root of the plant. This leads to a strengthening of the plant's own defense system and also stimulates the plant's growth. We have seen that chitin is a fast-acting source of nitrogen, as more than half of the total nitrogen content can be mineralized within 100 days. This nitrogen is then available for plants for uptake. However, there were large differences between the different sources of chitin and also the effect on crops was different between tomatoes, strawberries and lettuce. So chitin can clearly become an important ingredient in growing media. If chitin can help plants to become naturally more resistant to disease, that could help reduce the need for plant protection treatments. On top of that, chitin, when properly extracted, can also replace synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. That's good news for the farmer, for our environment, and for combating climate change. So, good afternoon. Um, I will um, give you a presentation about the, the work we have done uh, within Gohorted Blue Sea about the uh, uh, lab scale extraction of chitin. Um, so within the presentation, I will cover here these three points. So I will give you, a, I'll tell you a few words about chitin for those who have no idea what chitin is. Then I will tell you something about the uh, general principles of uh, the, our chemical extraction we have done, and then tell you something about the two species uh, we do work with. Um, so chitin, it's um, a major molecule, a major constituent of the exoskeleton of uh, arthropods. So we focus on crustaceans, so on crabs and on shrimps. Uh, so the uh, molecule, it's uh, a polysaccharide. Um, and so important is, so here is the basic um, monomer of the chitin. And uh, chitin itself is acetylated. So I'm pointing here this on this slide because in the next slide we'll tell you something more about that acetyl group. Uh, so important is the exoskeleton is actually composed of a huge fraction of the polysaccharide, which is actually the frame of the hard parts of the shell. We have worked with uh, two species. So first the shrimp. We have seen the movie of uh, Willy that is doing the, the peeling work. So we we work with the peels of the shrimp, and we also work on the, the complete Chinese mitten crab. So the Chinese mitten crab is a, an invasive species in uh, several rivers and uh, also the sea here in, uh, in Belgium. So uh, the general principle of our extraction is we have two parts. We have a demineralization part in which we treat the uh, shrimps or the uh, shells or a paste of it with uh, hydrochloric acid. Uh, this is actually eliminating the calcium carbonate and the calcium chloride. And uh, that paste is undried. And on that, we do a second treatment. This is the deprotonation step in which via sodium hydroxide, we do remove the proteins. And then we again dry uh, that paste and end up with a kind of powder. So a bit more into, so no. Also to mention, sometimes what you see in reports of literature is that some uh, additional treatments are done. So often uh, people talk about chitosan. So chitosan is actually the deacylated form of chitin. So I have shown in my previous slide the uh, acetyl group on chitin. So what you do making chitosan from chitin is you do remove the acetyl group. This is an important difference because uh, this is um, actually beneficial for the solubility of the protein. So chitosan is relatively good soluble, while chitin is an insoluble molecule. A molecule. So for certain application, 
that is an important feature for chitosan. Often what you also see is sometimes the color do interfere. So sometimes then a peroxide treatment is done to decolorize the, the shells that you have like a white shell and at the end also a white powder. We have not done this extraction because it does not interfere with our plant treatments we, we opt for. So if you look to different crustaceans, uh, here you see the average of the percentage chitin that is in the shells. So here you see the Chinese mitten crab and here the shrimp. So you see they contain around an average 25% of, uh, of the weight of the shell is also chitin. So the Chinese mitten crab and shrimps are relatively good sources of chitin from that point of view. So here you see some more detailed pictures of the lab. So this is the work we have done with Chinese mitten crab. So we use the intact crab because it's impossible, it's relatively small, small crabs. It is impossible to remove the shells and uh, the hard parts, uh, species per species. So therefore we use the complete uh, shell and we do a kind of shredding. So you see a kind of bit dirty, uh, dirty paste. And on that we do then the chemical extraction. So the demineralization, the protonation part, and then we end up with uh, the chitin. So we have done different methods. I'm not going into detail, but uh, one of the methods in which we use 10% of sodium hydroxide and uh, for the deproteination and 6% of uh, hydrochloric acid for the demineralization or the best, uh, best parameters for the highest efficiency. This was work done on Chinese mitten crab. So we often got questions what about uh, the contaminants? Because typically um, in marine environment, you do assessment of uh, marine contaminants. So pHs is typically assessed. Uh, here you see um, what we have measured in the, in the Chinese mitten crabs from the pHs. We have also done heavy metal work. So you also see some heavy metals or in relatively high concentration, but I will mention on my last slide uh, that it's not such a problem because she was away during the procedure. And we have also done um, PCB analysis on Chinese mitten crabs. Also you, here, you see some high levels, but um, often, no, not often PCBs and pHs do accumulate in fat. So if you opt for a valorization within, uh, within plants, this is of, also of, uh, of no risk. So this was the work done with Chinese mitten crab. We have also done uh, the work with Kranhon Kranhon, so the, the, the shrimp. So, uh, the shrimp is also a delicacy in uh, a lot of cuisines. So here's, here you see uh, a typically Flemish meal with um, shrimps with tomato. We have also then only with the, with the peels done the chitin extraction. And here we have uh, also developed an optical method, which is described here. So here you see some differences. I'm not going into detail about this, but if you want to know more information, you can always contact me. So, so also here, um, also here, we have done the chemical analysis and uh, actually uh, see also certain levels, but that are not of risk for pHs and also for metals and for PCBs. But here to mention, here you see the, uh, uh, the heavy metals as uh, measured in the, uh, in the pure shells. And this is then the heavy metals we have uh, measured in the prepared chitin. So what you see is, fortunately, we do uh, remove most of the heavy metals during the, uh, during the procedure. So um, there is actually a, a small risk of being uh, a problem within the plant trials, also because uh, chitin is just uh, used in a small part um, in the soil. So uh, that means that uh, although these um, typical marine contaminants are present, there are not of risk for further treatment in uh, plant trials. So, so this was the work done um, on small scale. Um, we have also upscaled that work that was done by Lupna. So Lupna will now uh, give more information about, uh, about, that, about that work. But if you have a question, please don't hesitate to contact me or Bart. We will be very helpful We'll be very happy to help you. So thank you. Thanks, Johan. 
Um, and now we're going to hear from Dr. Lubna Ferdius, Assistant Professor at the University of Lille. Lubna is going to tell us about the upscaling of chitin extraction, uh, as Johan mentioned. Um, and again, we have a short film to describe this process. Uh, so, in this presentation, I will present you the process we implemented at Lille uh, for the enzyme-assisted extraction of chitin from shrimp shells at pilot scale for the Holt uh, Lucy project. Next slide, please, uh, Laura. Uh, so, here I remind the average composition of shrimp shells. Uh, it has been described that shells contain uh, between uh, 30 and 40 percent of chitin. Uh, 34% of protein, 30% of minerals, and uh, uh, between 5 and 10% of the lipids. Next. So one can represent schematically a shrimp shell uh, in this way. Uh, we have chitin, which is bounded to uh, proteins, uh, minerals, lipids, and of course, water. 
So to be able to uh, extract cytin, two steps are allotyrid, deprotonation, and demyelization. At least uh, enzyme-assisted extraction method was chosen. So first, uh, we implemented the process at the laboratory scale. This process consisted of a demineralization step uh, by uh, uh, acid, uh, phosphoric acid hydrolysis by enzyme. Uh, in our case, it was alkalized. After a step of uh, enzyme inactivation uh, by acid, um, we have steps of filtration and washing uh, before dry, drying to obtain the final product. So here you have a schematic uh, representation of uh, uh, different steps of uh, the obtention of chitin uh, by enzymatic way. We have studied the effect of uh, time of hydrolysis, comparison, uh, pH, and uh, we have tested two enzymes, uh, alkalase and cysteine. So the optimal conditions for us was, were alkalase as enzyme, uh, a pH of 8.5, a temperature of uh, 50, uh, 55 degrees, and the duration of the reaction of five hours. hours. Next. So these conditions were implemented at the pilot scale, as uh, shown in the video. Uh, here I'll show you the steps and the quantities uh, which were involved in the process. Uh, typically, we process uh, 25 kilograms per production. Uh, we have uh, processed, we have been processing for the last few months uh, shells, uh, shells supplied by Copalis, whom I would like uh, to thank. Um, uh, these shells uh, were characterized were characterized by a dry matter of uh, 27 persons. Uh, first, uh, shells are uh, are grinded and then uh, mix it with water in a such way to have a ratio of uh, uh, solid water of dirt. And the mixture uh, was then introduced in the reactor. Uh, we implemented the, the conditions uh, what we developed at the last scale. And the total volume uh, in the uh, reactor uh, was 74 liters. After the reaction, uh, uh, reactor was uh, was emptied and uh, the solid was washed and dried. And here we have the final product. So typically we obtain one kilogram of dried uh, chitin from 25 uh, kilogram of shells processes. Uh, here I present you a comparison of basic characteristics in terms of dry matter, protein, and ash content between shells and the produced uh, chitin. With our process, we obtain a dry matter yield of 15% uh, uh, and the percentage deprotonation of 72%. For ash, the results are variable depending on the batch. Uh, it can work very well by ash season uh, total demonization, but this is not always the case. So if you need chitin, you know that we can make it a leak. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Lubna. Um, Bart from Ilvo is going to tell us, he's been looking at the chemical characteristics of the prepared chitin. Okay, thank you, uh, Cressida. So we move to the chemical characteristics of the chitins that were produced uh, in the project. So to um, repeat, actually we had the chemical extractions at ILVO uh, where we use different feedstocks and there we did also the chemical characterization with focus on the nitrogen content, but also the nitrogen uh, mineralization. Then we had tests at uh, Université de Lille on the enzymatic processing and the upscaling uh, in, in the pilot uh, facility. And then we had the thermal treatment at ECN-TNO. So we called them the, the charred shrimps or the shrimps. Uh, where we torrified materials at 200, 255, and 300 degrees. So uh, I have a, a question for you. Uh, so what do you think about the mass loss during this processing? So uh, we compare torrefaction at 200 degrees versus chemical treatment of shrimp shells. Uh, so how, uh, what's the percentage of mass loss that you expect? Do you expect it to be higher 
uh, for torrefaction and smaller for uh, extraction? Do you expect it to be higher for extraction than for torrefaction? Or do you, do you expect it to be uh, for both methods equally high or equally low? So you can answer the question. Um, and then we can go on with uh, the presentation. So while you answer the question, I'll go to the next uh, slide, because of course we want to know what happens with the shrimp shells during the processing. So here we have data for the pure shrimp shells that came out of the North Sea, as you can see, because they have a very high salinity. They also have a very high pH value, uh, and of course also very high sulfate and chloride contents. And we see, um, we see an, a nitrogen content of almost 8%. And relatively high um, macronutrient concentrations, and I see that we have a, a lot of chitin experts in the in the webinar today. So your answer is right. It's uh, we saw that during um, ah no sorry um, the mass loss during torrefaction actually was very low. It was smaller than twenty percent, while the mass loss during chemical extraction it was very high. So you only remained like twenty percent of the initial uh, mass. So um, so here you have the data for the the pure shrimp shells. What is also important here is to mention that the uh, um, the inorganic carbon contents uh, content, so the carbonates which are available, it's quite high in the shrimp shells. So they are quite alkaline. And if we then go to the processed uh, materials, so here we compare the charred materials with uh, the extracted chitin. So we see that when you char the material, you keep the high salinity, you keep like all the macronutrients, as you can see here, that even the con total concentrations are even increasing, like you can see for calcium or potassium. Uh, we see that the nitrogen content uh, keeps almost the same. And also the carbonates, they are still in the, the, the charred shrimps. So you keep all, uh, all content uh, in the charred material, and it's mostly even uh, up concentrated. While when you look at the chemical extracted uh, material, you see a very strong decline in the salinity. There are almost no nutrients uh, in that material anymore. And you also see, of course, that the carbonates, that they, are, they have gone due to the acidic uh, treatment. But the nitrogen, total nitrogen content, it's still uh, quite high. So uh, we wanted to check the nitrogen mineralization from this material and why is it important? Well, uh, when you start in, so in uh, soilless cultivation from chemical fertilizers or fertigation, you know that almost all mineral, all nitrogen that is available is already available in mineral uh, nitrogen uh, form. So it's readily available. However, when you start from organic fertilizers or composts, the nitrogen is mostly organically bound and it still needs to be mineralized before it can be taken up by the plant. So that's a huge difference in timing and concentration. And also for chitin, we expect that uh, we need first the, the mineralization uh, of the nitrogen before plants can uh, use this nitrogen for plant growth. And to make the difference with biochar, there you have only a very small amount of nitrogen, which is also slow, only not available to plants. So it's, it's really strongly bound in the biochar. So how do we measure this nitrogen mineralization? Well, we do an incubation trial at 15 degrees. Uh, we mix an organic uh, fertilizer in mineral soil at a dose of 170 kilogram nitrogen per hectare. But we don't do it in hectares, of course, we do it in small tubes that we put in an incubation uh, closet. And we measure the, the mineral nitrogen at different times during this uh, 112 days, so 12 weeks. So we measure uh, the, the release of mineral nitrogen. And then we make a linear model and we calculate the nitrogen mineralization. So here you'll see uh, for the chemical extracted chitin, uh, we see um, the release of mineral nitrogen. So what we see is actually in the beginning that there is no mineral nitrogen available, but we see that there is a strong increase. And already after four weeks, we see that 
half of the total mineral, uh, total nitrogen in the material has been mineralized. And you see then a slow decrease after, uh, increase afterwards. So we see low uh, content in the beginning and mineral form, but a very uh, strong release slowly after incorporation in the soil or in the growing medium. In contrast, for the torrified shrimp shells, we see no mineral nitrogen in the beginning, but not uh, later on in the process as well. So here there is no mineralization uh, going on. So this nitrogen mineralization experiment, we did it for different uh, types of chitin. So we had uh, chemical treated shrimp shells, uh, chemical treated uh, Chinese meat and crab. Then we had the torrified shrimp shells at the different temperatures. Uh, and the same uh, torrified materials we treated with acids afterwards. And we had the commercial chitin and we clearly saw two groups. So the, um, we saw that all material that was torrified had a very low nitrogen release, while all chemical uh, extracted chitins had a very high mineral nitrogen release. And it was comparable as the commercial reference. So, uh, here you'll see different kind of uh, chitin that we have extracted and that we have tested both for the chemical properties and for the nitrogen mineralization. And we clearly see a differentiation uh, between chemical treatment and thermal treatment. Uh, for thermal treatment, all nutrients are kept in the material and you have a chitin with a very high salt content, while for the chemical treated chitins, we have low nutrient contents and low salt contents. And then we also see the big difference in nitrogen mineralization. It's very low for the thermal treated materials, while it's very high for the chemically treated materials. So when you incorporate this chitin in a growing medium and you want to use it in a greenhouse, you want, of course, to know how it will interact with uh, the capacity of a growing medium to recycle water and nutrients. Uh, so it's a uh, vital uh, aspect of, of growing uh, in a greenhouse that you can recirculate water and nutrients, but we want to know the interaction with the chitin. So did, we tested it in two ways. In the first uh, way, we did a leaching experiment with a fertigation solution, and we checked how chitin interacted with this solution. And in a second step, we did a greenhouse trial to check the, the growth, but also the, the nutrient uptake in the plants. And here, there was also a clear difference between chemical and thermal treated uh, materials. So for chemical uh, treated materials, we observed there was uh, like a potassium retention. So it's, uh, it indicates, although you have nitrogen release, we saw that there was like a an, an, an temporary immobilization of, of the potassium. Uh, so that's important to know, of course, to when you use this material in greenhouses to avoid nutrient imbalances for your plants. While for the thermal treated materials, we saw that, that uh, for instance, the potassium, uh, the phosphorus, sorry, but also sodium and chlorides, they were easily released from the material into the, the drain. Then we, when we look at the plant uptake, we saw for the chemical treated plants that there was a higher nitrogen uptake. So the nitrogen which is released from the chitin is taken up by the plants. While for the thermal treated uh, chitins, we see that the, the high nutrient content for phosphorus and other macronutrients, it's reflected in a higher plant uptake by, uh, for these elements. So thank you for your interest in these chemical uh, characteristics. So all data that you see today in the presentations, uh, you can ask us, of course, but they are also in, in a publication that we made on all these trials. So you can find all details on the methods, but also on the analysis results in this publication. Thanks, Bart. Um, and now Dr. Jane DeBode from Ilvo is going to share her findings on chitin for plant health and growth. Thanks, Jane. So hello, uh, everybody. So um, I will start uh, my presentation. What's a poll? Because it's also the content of my presentation. So um, my question is, if you add chitin uh, to, as an additive uh, to growing medium for plants, does it act as a biofertilizer? Does it act as a biopesticide? Or does it act as a biostimulant? 
Um, however, the answer to this question uh, will be only will be given at the end of this presentation because I hope that during my presentation it will become clear what the uh, answer is. But one thing I already want to say is that um, one thing is uh, key. Uh, and this and these three processes and this is the microbiology so the microbiology in your growing medium is key for chitin to fulfill its function in growing media and here you have a slide uh, that shows that theoretically how can chitin can be broken down in the growing medium so chitin as Johan, Johan said is a biopolymer and it can be uh, broken down um, but for uh, this breakdown you need um, enzymes and these enzymes are, are produced by the microbes in your growing medium. Uh, the first pathway leads to CO2 and ammonium, so that means it can be it can be act as a, uh, chitin can act as a biofertilizer. The second um, the second um, pathway, chitin is broken down to uh, chitosan, and from chitosan it's known as a biostimulant or a um, biopesticide because it um, stimulates the plant defense. However, this is uh, how it's done in theory. Uh, at Ilvo, uh, we did uh, some plant uh, pot uh, plant trials uh, to test uh, this in practice. So how does chitin act when you add it to the growing medium and if you, and if you grow plants on this growing medium? We tested our hypothesis with two uh, type of plants. So lettuce on the one hand and strawberry on the other hand. So we added chitin to the growing medium and we looked at plant growth at the nitro content, both in the growing medium and in the plant. And at the microbiology uh, around the roots of the plant, it's called the rhizosphere microbiology. In addition, we also looked at plant health. So for a salmonella, we looked at the human pathogen that can be present on lettuce. As, um, and uh, for lettuce, we looked at the human pathogen that can be present on the leaves. This is salmonella. And for strawberry, it looked at the plant pathogen. Uh, this is Botrytis cinerea, as you probably all know, know, all know as the gray mold pathogen. Um, all the results I will present today are uh, already published, or most of them, in um, open access journals, so you can find them on the internet. But uh, if you want to, uh, you can also always email us and we will send you uh, the papers. So my first question was, does chitin act as a biofertilizer? So we added chitin to the growing medium uh, of strawberry, but without strawberry plants and with strawberry plants. <laughs> Uh, then, after um, three, six, and nine weeks after adding the chitin, we looked at available nitrogen in the growing medium. So the yellow bars are with chitin, the brown bars are without chitin, and you see that in the growing medium without plants, there is a clear increase of the plant available nitrogen uh, in the growing medium. However, if you look in the growing medium with plants, you don't see this effect. But this can be explained by the fact that nitrogen is taken up by the plants. So here again, you see the yellow line, you see an increase in the total nitrogen, both in the leaves and in the fruits of strawberry. Then um, if you look at other systems, so the salmonella and the lettuce, and we ask the same question, can chitin be a biopesticides. So uh, in this picture, you see that if you add chitin to lettuce, um, to the growing medium of lettuce, you clearly see an increase of growth. So this is without chitin, this is with chitin. Uh, and uh, secondly, we also inoculated the leaves with salmonella. Uh, and then you see after four and eight days after inoculation of the leaves with, uh, with salmonella, you see a clear um, decrease of the amount of salmonella on your leaves. If you then look at the other system, this is strawberry and botrytis cinerea. So we did the same. We inoculated the leaves with botrytis and we scored the leaves for symptoms from zero to four. And if you then see seven days and nine days after inoculation, this is without chitin, this is with chitin, you clearly see a decrease of the symptoms caused by botrytis cinerea on the strawberry leaves. If we then look at the genes of the plants, so we looked at uh, genes that are known to be involved in the defense of the plant against pathogens. And we looked at expression of these genes. 
for the, the brown bars are without chitin, the yellow bars are with chitin, and the, the bars with stripes are after the inoculation of the pathogen, you clearly see that chitin uh, um, upregulates expression of the genes involved uh, in defense of the plant. And more specifically, this uh, increase is more clear if the pathogen is present. And this is, in fact, the definition of priming agents. So in priming agents, um, um, boosts the defense system of the plant after that the pathogen is present on the plant. However, all the results I showed until now are done with a chitin that was extracted from crab shells. But in the Heart to Blue Sea project, we also focused on shells of shrimps, as you saw in the video. Uh, here you see, um, so here you see the results of other types of chitin also extracted from shrimp shells. So here the red uh, arrow is our reference. And here are four types of chitin. The first is uh, our reference chitin, so the one extracted from uh, crab shells, and the other three are uh, chitins from uh, shrimp shells. However, only three or only two of the shrimp shells uh, showed uh, the same effect as the reference um, chitin that we saw less symptoms on the strawberry leaves. However, if we looked more to the details to what was happening um, in the growing medium and around the root, so at the rhizosphere microbiology, we saw that the three chitins that were successful, that, that this was also linked with an increase of the microbiology as measured with PLFA. However, um, PLFA is a very good method, but you only see the microbial biomass. So we clearly saw if the chitin is affected as a biopesticide, we see an increase of micro, we see an increase of the biomass of microorganisms in the rhizosphere. But um, with PLFA, you only see biomass. And with this technique, this is a DNA, DNA barcoding technique, you can more look into detail which microorganisms are responsible which, mic which microorganisms are increased in the rhizosphere. So we looked using this metabarcoding method, we looked at lettuce and we looked at strawberry. For lettuce, we looked at one time point. So the light green bars are uh, without chitin, the dark green bars are with chitin. And then it, here, this is um, the results of the fungi in the rhizosphere. And then you clearly see very remarkable that one group is highly increased when chitin is added. And these are the film of the Sihomikota. Um, for strawberry, we did the same. So here, this is uh, without chitin. This is with chitin. Um, and um, we even there took several time points. So every week, we measured the rhizosphere microbiology around the roots of the strawberry plants. And you can clearly see that when chitin is added, these blue bars are highly bigger than here, so then without chitin. And we look if we look into um, details, uh, then we see that this group are the Mortirello micota. This was very interesting. So we tried to isolate some of these strains out of this group, and we succeeded with that. So here you see uh, five of these strains who are grown on plates uh, who are present in this group. Um, and then uh, we did a very simple test. So we used the spores of these strains and we, um, we uh, added them to the, um, to the plates of Arabidopsis. And here, the, so this is without the spores of these strains and this is with the spores of these strains. And you clearly can see that the Arabidopsis uh, is stimulated, the growth of this Arabidopsis is stimulated. So if you want to answer the question um, is, um, chitin a biostimulant? Yes, it's a biostimulant, but not directly. So it's activated. Uh, it's activating the plant growth, promoting bacteria around the roots, uh, and this is this is why we can say, okay, chitin is also biostimulant. So this is how I come uh, to my last slide, and yeah, where it's also um, like the answer to the question, and it was a little bit a tricky question because there was no wrong answer. So chitin can be all three. It can be a biofertilizer, it can be a biopesticide, and it can be a biostimulant. So all depends on the claims you make. So uh, this already said, uh, but there are some buts, of course. Um, several things you have to take into account. First, that the feedstock and the production method of the chitin is important. So some chitins uh, were affected, but other chitins were not. 
you also have to take into account the nutrient level that's already present in your growing medium. If your nutrient levels are very are already very high, it has no uh, it makes no sense to add more nutrients by the nitrogen. And I think the most important but is that yeah, we didn't add new microbial life to the growing medium by this chitin. We stimulated microbial life that was already present into the chitin. Uh, that was already present into the growing medium, sorry. So thank you all for listening. And first of all, I want to thank all the ladies of our microbiology group at ILVO, but of course, all the whole um, Horti Blue Sea uh, consortium with a special, bar, uh, special thanks to Bart, who is the coordinator, but who was also uh, responsible for the nutrient analysis in, in this work that I presented. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Really nice work, really striking results for chitin, the use of chitin as a biopesticide. Um, so, Bart, could you please brief us now on the cost and legislation aspects of using chitin? Yes, I will. No problem. Um, so, Okay, so what um, to wrap up what we heard about uh, the technical aspects of the, the chitin is, of course, that it's um, an amendment to be used in very small amounts, because if you use higher amounts, you can get problems with hydrophobicity in your growing medium. We see that the chitin is really a source of mineral nitrogen, so you have to take it into account for your plant production. Um, we saw a clear increase in microbial biomass in the growing medium and also positive effects um, on disease resistance in some cases. So this chitin, it can have different roles, but what can we pay or what are we willing to pay for this chitin? Um, well, we have uh, made an, a first cost calculation for the different uh, treatment uh, options that we have tested, but you have to take into account, of course, that we did not include yet a staff cost because these uh, tests were done at different scale levels, which makes it quite difficult to compare staff costs in that uh, um, situation. And of course, we did not uh, include a cost for the shells themselves. So you, you merely have the, the price of the, the production um, in technical terms. Uh, to keep uh, in mind, of course, is also that some trials were done at lab scale. It was just uh, to, to focus on how to produce chitin and what is the quality of this chitin. While we also produced at, at batch scale or um, at pilot scale, it means that it's for a uh, larger amounts of chitin. And here you'll see the costs that we have. So it's very high for the lab scale extraction, but it's not realistic, of course, because you use um, a lot of chemicals for producing a small amount, but maybe you can optimize it when you upscale. Uh, that's what we see when we scale up to the batch reactor uh, at Université de Lille. There is the, the price for the chitin is already much lower. And then uh, the other extreme is the torrified chitin, which is very low in cost price. However, uh, you, you remember from uh, the previous presentations that the quality of the torrified chitin is also completely different. So it's mainly a source of salts and, and macronutrients while it's not really a source of mineral nitrogen and also the effects on, on plant, uh, this, uh, the plant defense were much uh, less expressed for these uh, uh, torrified materials. And then we come to the legislation uh, when you make uh, or when you want to use chitin from shellfish waste. Uh, so for organic agriculture, uh, chitin is, it is allowed to be used as a fertilizer in the, in the EU. Um, to use chitin as a fertilizing product, um, the, the regulation is still under construction, so it's not clear what will be the criteria for having a, a CE mark on a chitin product in Europe. And you also have to take into account that um, chitin, of course, when it comes from shellfish, it's an animal byproduct. So you have to cope with uh, this regulation. And there is an option to leave this regulation and to come into the fertilizer products regulation, which allows you to have it as a fertilizer. In the meantime, we have national legislations like in Belgium. You can uh, have a claim as a nitrogen fertilizer for chitin. And this claim should be supported by measurements of total nitrogen content, but also of uh, this nitrogen release within a certain period. So thank you for your attention. 
Thanks, Bart. Um, um, as part of the Haughty Blue Sea project, we've developed a number of tools and Laura is now going to tell us about some of these tools and um, give us a quick tour of the project website. Hello, let me show you the Horty Blue Sea website. On the Horty Blue Sea website, we are establishing an online collaborative platform. One of the features of that online platform is the decision tool. To get to the decision tool, go to the Horty Blue Sea website and click online platform and then decision tool. When you get to the decision tool page, click the image of the decision tool and it will open in a new tab. The decision tool shows you how a couple of residual materials can be processed or treated into new building blocks for sustainable growing media, energy and CO2 fertilizer. The advantage of the tool is that you can access the information from different starting points. You can start, for example, from one of the residual biomasses and find out how it can be processed. But you can also start by clicking one of the processing methods or treatments. But you can also start on the right from one of the outputs that you want to obtain. To get more detailed information about the processing methods and the characteristics of the feedstocks, scroll down. If you have more questions or if you want to give feedback on the tool, click the contact button, write your email and your question or feedback and submit it. So I hope you will find the tool um, helpful and that you will enjoy trying it out. For each of the valorization chains, Horty Blue Sea has made a SWOT analysis. This SWOT analysis is actually the first step in illustrating the feasibility of the different valorization chains. A fact sheet with those SWOT analysis can be found on the Horty Blue Sea website. Go to Project Outputs and then go to the Valorization Chain page. If you scroll down on that page, you can find PDFs with the SWOT analysis which you can download. This is what the fact sheet for valorization chain 2 looks like. For each of the valorization chains, the fact sheet reports the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of one or more new solutions suggested by the Horty Blue Sea project versus a current baseline scenario. So please go visit and discover our Horty Blue Sea website and find out more about the valorization chains and the project in general. Thanks, Laura. Um, and now Dr. Mariana Gardner from the University of Portsmouth is going to demonstrate the Horty Blue Sea mapping tool, which promotes a circular economy for kiting reuse. So the aim of the mapping tool is to stimulate collaboration between involved stakeholders from harvesters to processors and to potential end users of self shellfish waste. This map is focused on the shellfish industry in the UK and is by no means exhaustive. So the dynamic pla platform is developed to establish contacts between stakeholders and identifying potential connections within a circular economy. And it's linked to a data table, either a Word document or a spreadsheet. And so if you then click onto the slide, which has the map of the UK and Ireland, you will see that it has um, several icons. And on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, there are fishery companies, uh, which, um, detail the harvesting and the processing and then you've also got the, um, the starred icons on the map itself. Uh, these are the processor organizations, the producers, the harvesters, processors and waste processors organizations and if you then um, click onto the next slide you'll see that 
Spellfish Limited comes up and that what they do um, with their waste, for example, is that it goes to local farmers for fertilizer and to Newcastle for processing where it's sold as ashtrays, etc. If you click on that icon again in the next slide, you'll see that um, the map itself is expanded directly to the location in Falmouth itself. And when you look, I'm going to give you another example. The next slide will show the blue seafood company in Devon. And this company has the most expensive um, information with regard to the fact that they not only harvest and process, but they also send their waste for processing to several places, to local farmers for fertilizer, to um, a project with a local authority to improve the land, and onward for bulking agent and pet food. And then again, once more onward for medical supplies and packaging. If you then look for, at the next example, we'll show you the research and development company. Um, they are based in Oban, it's called Kuantek, and they are doing advanced research and development, as I said, into shellfish waste. Again, on the left hand side, contact details show their, um, their web address and phone numbers, contact details, etc. Um, the next slide will show you that there are multiple ways that you can expand this type of mapping and to you could include, for example, information about um, innovative farmers who have used shellfish for um, treating potato pest. And you could also expand it for explaining um, further research done by UK biochar research centers and research done by the Coventry University. I hope that um, you will enjoy clicking on this map and exploring and seeing what the various harvesters and processes do. And that there will be um, an inspiration for collaboration. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Mariana. Nice demo of the mapping tool. I think we will start wrapping up now. Um, I know one, Bart wants to make a couple of announcements before we finish the meeting. Okay, thank you. So as we speak, you will receive a mail from us and in that mail, you will find a, a link to a very short questionnaire. So uh, take two or three minutes to answer these questions. Uh, we just want to know what you thought about the, the webinar and what are your remaining questions and what do you think about the idea of processing uh, shellfish residues into chitin? So please fill this questionnaire as soon uh, as possible. And if you uh, want to know more about this project and the other valorization chains, uh, it's just to, to let you know that we have uh, another webinar in June, uh, June 10th. It's on the, the recycling of spent growing media uh, and the direct reuse or the, the use as feedstock for biochar or compost production. So you can still register for that webinar as well. And then in fall, there will be a fourth webinar because uh, there we will focus on bulk replacement of peat, coir, and mineral wool by uh, renewable materials like biochar, uh, wood fibers, and, and other materials. So that's for uh, later this year. We also have two uh, Horty Blue Sea open events, one in Ghent in August um, in summer, and one in Portsmouth in October. So keep an eye on the website and we keep you informed about these events. So in these events, we will more focus on the outcome of the greenhouse trials with strawberry and tomato. You want to know more about growing media, then come to Ghent also this summer because we have an international symposium focusing on the physical, chemical and biological properties of growing media. 
We also have prepared some uh, videos on the different building blocks for uh, sustainable growing media. We have some papers that were published uh, open access. And we also have, of course, the decision tool, we, which has been highlighted uh, before. So um, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. And if you need more information, we have the, the website. You can contact Laura. You can follow us on Twitter. And we have a, a very uh, fashy uh, Horty Blue Sea YouTube channel that you can consult with a lot of information. So I would like to thank you for being in this webinar. And I give the word back to Krista, our chair of today. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. Yeah, thanks everyone so much for coming along and um, posting some really interesting questions into the chat box. Uh, we hope to see some of you at the next webinar in June. And uh, yeah, thanks very much and do keep in touch. Cheerio. Bye.